Inside Out 2 has officially become the highest grossing animated film of all time, beating out the 2019 John Favreau Lion King remake that was supposedly live action, but we all know it's CG. And now Pete Docter, the head of Pixar, seems to be saved, but he's going to be doing it in a way that's a lot safer. Let's talk about that here on That Park Place. Hello, I am Jonas J. Campbell, an investigative reporter for That Park Place. It's just me today, but I wanted to get out this news here on this Labor Day, talking about the fact that Inside Out 2 has now overtaken The Lion King globally, it looks like. But Despicable Me 4 has gotten above 900 million worldwide. Good for them. Alien Romulus there, and It Ends With Us. Two films that probably not going to catch those anytime soon. Nothing against them. This article out of Deadline by Nancy Tartaglioni. Updated, while the calendar has clicked over to September, summer vibes are still being felt at the global and international box office. In yet another ascent, and on its 12th weekend of release, Disney Pixar's Inside Out 2 has now grossed 1.666 billion globally. Not going to read into that, huh? Overtaking 2019's The Lion King to become the ninth biggest movie ever at the worldwide box office. The cube through Sunday is an estimated 1.666.2. Summer has indeed been good to Disney and its brands and vice versa between Pixar's Inside Out 2 and Marvel's Deadpool and Wolverine. Disney boasts the two biggest movies of the year and the only billion dollar grocers so far. Meanwhile, 20th Century's Alien Romulus is chomping its way to 300 million global. They're, they're chomping with that little teeny tiny mouth that comes out of the Xenomorph's mouth. That's That explains the uh, difference in income there. This is fascinating to me, and I've seen Inside Out 2. Um, I got to say, it is a film, and <laughs> it is a miracle when any film gets made, but Inside Out 2 is nothing compared to the original. Uh, obviously, the original being directed by Pete Docter under the influence of the Pixar uh, brain trust there, which was under John Lasseter. It is a masterpiece that has so many layers to it, each scene having not just the the text but also the subtext sometimes layers of subtext underneath it and um, so this essentially saves pixar I, I don't know how in danger pixar ever was of disappearing as a brand but disney has uh, essentially two animation studios right now one of them not doing so hot and they've promised that they're going to be doing sequel after sequel for those of you who don't know which studio i'm talking about here i'm talking about just for a moment walt disney animation studios which is doing moana 2 and of course they'll be and, and they'll end up doing a live action remake of that but that's not what i'm talking about here. They're also doing Frozen 3 and 4 because these films that take like five years to make, they're going ahead and doing a two-parter, like a Back to the Future 2 and 3 shooting at the same time, or like a Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men's Chest, and At World's End 2 at the same time because there's just too much story in Frozen 3 to just be in one movie. Or maybe they just don't know what they're doing and they're going to intend for it to be a three and a four. I got to say, after seeing Frozen 2, I think the music was a little bit more bopping, but uh, Frozen 1, the more solid movie there. Now, Pixar seems to be saying they're going to be playing the hits as well, because over here uh, at Deadline, Pixar's Pete Doctor on what they expect from the sequels, uh, this by Armando Tinoco. There he is, Pete Doctor. Pixar's chief creative officer explains what the animation studios expects from their sequels with a sequel to The Incredibles and Toy Story. Yes, if you didn't catch that, they're going to be doing an Incredibles 3, and they're bringing back Brad Bird to do that. There's a little bit of drama there because Brad Bird left to go work with John Lasseter over there at Skydance, and he's working on a film called Ray Gun. Now, the rumors I hear about that one is it's been a little bit rocky trying to get that film together, but bringing Brad Bird back to Pixar after he defected to go work with the fired head of Walt Disney Creative, that's, uh, that's kind of a big deal. Also, they I think they announced it before the ink was still dry over there at D23 because uh, Pete Doctor just went on stage and said, we're doing it. And then he said Brad Bird was coming back because I think they're they're looking for signaling of legitimacy here. Toy Story, uh, another similar issue here. This was announced that they were doing a sequel to Toy Story and Bob Iger on an earnings call was very careful not to say Toy Story 5, at least at first. He said the next Toy Story film and then Pete Docter at the Inside Out 2 premieres, um, I think one of them in maybe Arizona, he said 
that there's someone familiar that is going to be in charge of that film. And they basically said Andrew Stanton would be directing that one. For those of you not familiar with Andrew Stanton, he is one of the original Pixar brain trust. He directed Finding Nemo. I think he also directed Finding Dory, which Finding Dory is a is a film that you have to be told it's about uh, disability and things like that. It's actually an excellent sequel when it comes to sequels. One of the reasons I have a little bit more faith in Toy Story 5 is at D23, they announced that Andrew Stanton would not just be directing it, he would also be writing the movie, which a lot of directors at Pixar end up with some kind of writing credit, it seems like. I'm not doing a scientific study there, so don't hold me to that if I'm a little wrong. Actually, I'm going to do a little research on that after this is done. But they've said that the theme of Toy Story 5 is going to be the fact that there will be technology at play here as in, and not just in the same way that they, you know, had the first CGI animated picture over there at Pixar. It will be that the characters in the story, it will be the toys reacting to technology being integrated into children's lives. I think that's uh, probably going to be interesting. And for those of you who have been following this channel, you know that that is something that uh, we've talked about in the past. Andrew Stanton also being the director of WALL-E, which is an, a, basically a comment on consumerism in the fact that you have a bunch of fat people in chairs that are just waiting for the next thing, sitting on this, this uh, giant ship in the sky, being told, no, you have a purpose somewhere. But for the moment, let's keep you busy with uh, new milkshakes and new entertainment and uh, a little bit on the Lido deck. It's a combo, of course, to get back to this uh, Pete Doctor situation here. It's a combo, of course, because we're making these for the audience, not for ourselves. So you want to know if they'll be well-received, Doctor said in an interview with Fandango. Then we do have a sort of guideline or guardrail that if we get a certain way and it's not feeling like it's about something new and substantive, then we'll cut bait. So it's imperative that something feels like, oh, this is furthering the story. Doctor continues. I was talking about something that we didn't explore in the first one or something deeper that we didn't explore about the human condition or our own experiences in life. I've seen Inside Out 2. The main plot is about whether or not uh, Riley gets on the hockey team. And she thinks that this is a pivotal moment in her life. Of course, the audience knows that this is not a big deal. This is one of the reasons that the subtext does not work as well in Uh, Inside Out 2 as it did in Inside Out 1 because Riley was going to be doing something dangerous. She was cutting herself off from her emotions and she was running away from home to go back to uh, wherever it was she was from before. Maybe it was Toronto. I don't know. Always seems to be Toronto. Although the studio has done sequels, Doctor recently said they were not going to do live action versions of their films. I'm going to skip ahead here. So if you have a human walk into a house that floats, your mind goes, wait a second, hold on. Houses are super heavy. How are balloons lifting the house? He continued. But if you have a cartoon guy and he stands there in the house, you go, "Okay, I'll buy it. The words we've built just don't translate very easily. That was worlds there, not just words. Now, one thing I do want to go to here is an older article from The Wrap. Uh, Pete Doctor opens up about the past, present, and future of Pixar, and this is when he was at the Annie Awards here. Drew Taylor writing this one back in February. There is a quote here, and let me find it. Doctor loves animation, all kinds. He worked on localized versions of Miyazaki's masterpieces back in the day. Ah, here it is. Not the doctor's time as COO has been without its speed bumps. The biggest being the release last summer of Lightyear, a bold science fiction story adventure that just so happened to be tangentially connected to the Toy Story universe. When asked about what happened with the film, which boasted an all-star cast, including Chris Evans and Kiki Palmer, Oh, I didn't even realize Kiki Palmer was in this. She's always trying to make a name for herself. Plus, whip smart direction from Pixar mainstay Angus McLean. Doctor was open and honest. We've done a lot of soul searching about that because we all love the movie. We love the characters and the premise. I think probably what we've ended on in terms of what went wrong is that we asked too much of the audience. When they hear Buzz, they're like, great, where's Mr. Potato Head and Woody and Rex? And then we drop them into the science fiction film. That They're like, what? Doctor said, even if they've read the material in the press, it was just a little too distant, both in concept and I think in the way that characters were drawn, that they were portrayed. It was much more of a science fiction and Angus, to his credit, took it very seriously and genuinely and wanted to represent those characters as real characters. But the characters in Toy Story are much broader. And so I think there was a disconnect 
between what people wanted and expected and what we were giving to them. Well, uh, I'm going to disagree functionally on Lightyear here. Lightyear takes Buzz and takes him from the 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 character who is so straight laced that he doesn't know he's funny and turns him into a goofball that everyone knows that he's wrong and even in fact he knows he's wrong. They introduce self doubt into Buzz Lightyear that it's actually the intrinsic part of his character. In fact, the entire arc of his character is because of self-doubt and they make him into the villain of the film. There's also the political aspect here and the fact that some parents were off put by what was put into the film in the light of the uh, arguments between Ron DeSantis and the Walt Disney Company. And when it comes down to it, the film made uh, a toxic masculine version of Buzz Lightyear into the villain of the film who would erase the LGBT couple from existence if he had his way, not directly because he was trying to get rid of them, but uh, he would have erased all of the diverse characters that Buzz had met along the way. It wasn't, I don't think they were intending on doing a woke film, but it was a, a pretty woke film when it came down to it. Inside Out 2 is not a woke film. It is a uh, pretty clean. And there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of weird messaging or anything like that, except it is a very diverse cast, but you would have to be looking for that in order to see that. So here is my question to the audience here. What do you think about Pete Doctor at this point? There was there was actually a moment. I'm, I'm going to point this out. Hayao Miyazaki and Pete Doctor were on stage together. And Pete Doctor asked Hayao Miyazaki, at what point do you consider the audience? And, you know, Translation, reinterpretation, whatever you want to say, Hayao Miyazaki essentially said, I never consider the audience. And this is Pete Doctor on the other side saying here, we need to consider the audience. Do you think that this is a stepping off point here for Pixar where they're going to have excellence and they're going to have a commercial success going forward? Or do you think this is essentially the end of Pixar where they're just going to be playing the hits? They're going to be another... Uh, lesser studio that I will not name directly that uh, that maybe just just does these brand deposits over and over and over again so they can maintain theme park lands. No new IP. We're just going to be recycling over and over again. Is it that kind of thing? Is Pixar done in that way and they're just the keepers of the past IP? Or do you see something in the future where Pixar can succeed at this point? I know that is a very philosophical question with a lot of different opinions that might get into it there, but I would love to see the comments on that in the comment section down below. Like this video if you like this video and consider subscribing to That Park Place for all the news that should be fun. Thanks for watching That Park Place News. For more information, consider checking out www.thatparkplace.com. And don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and send this out on your favorite social media accounts.